morning, sacrificing your very important jobs at home, and you are here. I strongly, warmly welcome you all to the second day session. And I hope we have uh, arranged a very interesting educative program, and I kindly welcome you all to stay there till the end, because some Im interesting sessions are there at the end. The ECG quiz, atrial fibrillation, imaging guidance, all very important topics in the afternoon. Please uh, stay till the end, and there are some competitions, quiz competitions, some prize givings, everything will be there, and you are eligible for the prizes only if you are available inside the physically available. So I think uh, you should be here to get the prizes, and some of them are surprising prizes, I hope. Uh, you all be here. So to start today's proceeding, uh, the lecture, the first lecture is on diabetes. Uh, it's a diabetes, what is new for clinical cardiologist? Uh, I call upon uh, the chairpersons, uh, Dr. Nimali Fernando and Dr. Namal Vijaysinghe to chair the session and conduct the proceedings. Good morning, everybody. As Dr. Mubarak said, the, our first session is on diabetes, what is new for clinical cardiologist. And Professor Ricardo Fontes does not need any introduction. Over to you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, good morning to everybody. Uh, for me, it's also, uh, it is a great pleasure to be here in Sri Lanka, and I would like to thank very much the invitation because uh, of several things but also for the historical ties that uh, uh, our two countries have for a long time. Yesterday when I was visiting this church in, here in Colombo, I realized that uh, actually we have a very good uh, relation and for instance you, he you see here also in my country the same church with the same uh, St. John, uh, St. Anthony's, and actually to yesterday it, there was a big party in Portugal to celebrate uh, uh, St. Anthony's and St. John's, and this is an, an, a good example on how our communities are very linked and very interconnected. So, what we are here to discuss today, I would say that it is a revolution in the field of cardiovascular disease, and also in the field of medicine. And as you will see, in the last three years, there has been a, uh, a huge advance in the management of uh, the diabetes, and especially the relation between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We will here discuss three, three topics. First, what is new in the association between diabetes and cardiovascular disease? Then we will see what has been this new world of the cardiovascular clinical trials with the, the, with the anti-diabetic drugs. And last but not least, what will change in our practice as cardiologists? What impact will it have in the clinical practice of cardiology? As we all know, uh, diabetes actually is a worldwide epidemic all over the world, not only in developed countries, but more and more in underdeveloped countries with more than uh, 300,000 uh, 300, people with diabetes. The great problem with the diabetes is that although we are usually very concerned in controlling the glycemic levels, most patients will die of cardiovascular disease and this is why it should be a focus also for the cardiologists. What has happened during the, during the years is that we live at what we call the glucose paradox. What is this? We know that controlling the amyoglobin A1C levels reduces the microvascular complications, but as you can see here, there is no single trial demonstrating that reducing amyoglobin A1C levels can reduce the risk of macrovascular complications. This led that, uh, this made that the cardiologists for a long time have not been that much interested in the field of the diabetes. But things are changing and they are changing quite fast. What is new, what is new in this field? The first thing that we are starting to learn is a new entity, a new uh, cardiovascular entity, which is the diabetic cardiomyopathy. What is this? When you look to the heart failure trials, to the latest heart failure trials, 
you see very well here that uh, there is a, a, a high prevalence of diabetes in people with heart failure. On the other hand, when you have a patient with diabetes, usually we are very concerned with the risk of angina or with the risk of myocardial infarction. But as you can see here, this is a very large uh, follow-up study. Usually the first manifestation of cardiovascular disease in diabetes patients usually are heart failure and as you can see here, the risk of peripheral artery disease. So heart failure is a major, uh, has a major importance in diabetes. What you can see is usually for years, we were used to associate diabetes and heart failure through this pathway, which was usually through the appearance of ischemic cardiomyopathy. What we know now is that although this can happen, of course, although the, the heart failure can occur induced by for due to ischemic cardiomyopathy, you can see here that there are a lot of mechanisms which are independent of ischemia that can lead to the appearance of heart failure, and this is what we usually call the diabetic cardiomyopathy. What is this diabetic cardiomyopathy? In, the, uh, in, an, in an early phase, it is characterized by the appearance in the changes in the diastolic function, as you can see here, even if you use the most advanced techniques to evaluate diastolic function. And this is one of the works that we did uh, some years ago, which was in a population of, of more than 1,000 patients, as you can see, which were followed up, we saw that diabetes is associated with subclinical diastolic dysfunction, but this also appears in the pre-diabetic phase when the patient has insulin resistance. And also here, in another tr study that we did, this is using the data from the MESA study from the US, where uh, 6,000 patients were submitted to MRI, you see the same thing, which is the appearance of changes in diastolic dysfunction in an early phase of the diabetic continuum, meaning that in the diabetes you have subclinical uh, myocardial dysfunction. So, beyond this classical view, we have now this diabetic cardiomyopathy, which is an independent risk factor for the appearance of heart failure. And now we can say that you know these stages of the heart, um, uh, American Heart Association of progression of heart failure. And you can see here that the first stage, people are at risk for heart failure. But in all these uh, three stages, we can say that diabetic cardiomyopathy can induce the heart failure. <coughs> What is happening now, as you can see here for several articles, every month in all major cardiovascular journals, you have an article about the relation between diabetes and, and cardiology. And this is all already called the field of the cardiodiabetology. I will briefly explain what is happening. I will try to summarize in 10 minutes what is happening with all the investigation which is uh, amazing in this new world of the cardiovascular clinical trials. As you probably know, this started some years ago. Probably this was started with a mistake, which is interesting, which was the report from Nissan saying that uh, this class of drugs could increase the risk of myocardial infarction. We know now that this is not true, but this led the FDA to uh, impose to the pharmaceutical companies that every new antidiabetic drug that was going to be approved had to demonstrate cardiovascular safety to in terms of cardiovascular events. And as you can see here, the number of clinical trials that were conducted in the last four years in all the continuum of cardiovascular disease, the amount of patients that were included is completely amazing. And this is one of the reasons why we are learning so much about the relation between diabetes and, heart, and uh, cardiovascular disease. The first group of trials that appeared was with the drugs that the cardiologists are very well familiar, which is the inhibitors of the DPPP4. As you know, these, these trials, there were three clinical trials, and overall, they showed that using this drug or using uh, placebo is exactly the same in terms of cardiovascular events. They don't reduce, but they don't uh, increase the risk of cardiovascular events. You see this with alogliptin. You see this also 
with the saxagliptin, although there was an increase in heart failure that I will detail in a moment, and also with citagliptin, they were all, as you can see, very similar in terms of the risk of cardiovascular events. So to summarize in one slide the, the results of these trials, you can see it either has a half full or half uh, empty glass, which is the diabetic, the, the, the endocrinologist will see it as half full because they have a drug to use which does not increase the risk of cardiovascular events, but we as cardiologists were a bit disappointed because what is the meaning of giving a drug that does not reduce significantly the risk of cardiovascular events. And actually there was a bit a small concern, which was in one of these trials, especially the one with saxagliptin, as you can see here, we saw an increase in the risk of heart failure when using this drug. There are several explanations, but actually what we know now, the, for instance, you can see this review, which is very interesting, is that this is probably a real effect and this is a biological effect of these drugs in increasing the risk of heart failure. But the best of the story is still to come. And the rest of the story started with the, the use of this new class of anti-diabetic drugs, which inhibits the SGLT2 uh, receptor, so the patient will uh, lose glucose in, uh, in urine. This was one, the first trial uh, that was conducted, the Empareg trial, with one of these drugs, empaglifosin. And this is the typical cardiovascular uh, clinical trial. It, can be, it could be used, for instance, to test an antiplatelet agent. It could be uh, to used to test an, an anti uh, uh, drug for, to treat dyslipidemia. And as you can see, these were the inclusion criteria, patients with established cardiovascular disease. Patients were randomized to placebo or either the lower dose of empaglifosin or a high dose of empaglifosin. And what was amazing was to see what happened in terms of cardiovascular events. At the beginning, they were trying to test if they were safe, these drugs were safe, but actually what they demonstrated is a, a significant reduction in the risk of cardiovascular events. As you can see, a huge decrease in cardiovascular mortality, a reduction in total mortality, and a reduction of heart failure. As you can see, there is a very early separation of the survival curves, and the absolute risk reduction, as you can see, is also very significant because you have a number needed to treat of only 45 to reduce cardiovascular mortality. And also what happened in terms of heart failure hospitalization was a major decrease in the risk of cardiovascular events. And again, regarding total mortality, if the patient dies or not using one of these drugs, there is a major decrease in the risk of total mortality. What can you see here in this slide is, is that if you want to induce cardiovascular protection, you only need the 10 milligrams dose because Increasing the dose, it can improve the control of the glycemic levels, but in terms of cardiovascular protection, does not give you an additional benefit. What happened also in terms of renal endpoints was the same. We can say now that beyond cardioprotection, this new class of drugs can induce nephroprotection because you have a, a reduction in the renal endpoints. There are several important things that we can discuss. The first thing is what can explain this reduction in cardiovascular events. There are several possible mechanisms. I'm not going to enter in details. We can leave this for the discussion. But it is very interesting to understand why did this happen and why did we have such a reduction in cardiovascular ev events. What we can see here is that this is a, a non-atherosclerotic effect. It is beyond atherosclerosis probably is very much related with the reduction in the risk of heart failure. I'm not going to enter into the details, but the million dollar question now are especially two regarding this. The first one is to think if this is a class effect or if it is due to only one drug. And the second if, is to ask if this is extensive also to patients which would never had a cardiovascular event. Now we can answer this question because there were, uh, six months ago, it, there were, we had the two clinical trials presented in this area. The first one was, with, is, was this one, published in New England, with canaglyphosine. And as you can see, with canaglyphosine, which is another agent acting in the same mechanism, is that you can also see the same reduction in the risk of cardiovascular outcomes and the same reduction in the hospitalization for heart failure. 
Also, some interesting data from real-world data, which were recently presented in circulation for, with a follow-up of uh, 300,000 patients from several countries. And most of these patients were from primary prevention and not secondary prevention. And you see the same effect, the same reduction in the risk of cardiovascular events. So apparently, yes, this is a class effect. And probably this can be translated into primary prevention in terms of treating the diabetic patient. The last group of data that we had was with the use of the GLP-1 agonists, which are a new class of drugs that act on the GLP-1 uh, uh, receptor. They are not so friendly for the cardiologist because they need to be injected to the patient. But what we saw in these cardiovascular clinical trials is this is apparently, we have cardiovascular benefit, but probably this is not a class effect because as you can see here, not all of these agents demonstrated a reduction in the risk of cardiovascular events. One of these was the use of liraglutide in this important clinical trial, which showed more or less the same thing. Again, a new antidiabetic drug that can significantly reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. As you can see here, it is a different effect. It's not related with a reduction in the risk of heart failure, as we saw before. It is more of an atherosclerotic effect, but again, there is another trial with another class of agents showing a reduction in cardiovascular events. So to conclude, this is one of the, is the latest meta-analysis which was published in JAMA very recently, only one month ago, regarding the use of these new uh, anti-diabetic drugs. And what you can see here, and this, is, this will be a major shift in our clinical practice, is the clear demonstration that these two new classes of drugs, the SLG2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 agonists, will reduce the risk, sorry, will reduce the risk uh, of cardiovascular events, but more importantly, the re it will, they will reduce the mortality. So to conclude, what will change in our clinical practice? How do we integrate all this data in our clinical practice? What we are seeing, you remember that uh, uh, Hippocrates was the person who made the the, 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 the founding of the modern medicine. And usually he used to say three things. When you are treating a patient, you should focus on saving lives, of course. You should focus on preserving health and you should focus on alleviating the suffering. What we saw until now was that we used to treat diabetes only by alleviating the suffering because we could reduce microvascular complications, but we cannot reduce the mortality when we could not reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. So what is now changing is that we are completely uh, with a new, co a new approach. Instead of having a glucocentric approach, which is very focused on the control of hemoglobin A1C levels, we are moving to a cardiovascular events reduction approach. And actually, I like very much this article, which is the implications that this can have for the practice of the cardiologist. With this great power of reducing cardiovascular events, comes a great responsibility, not only for the endocrinologist, but also for the cardiologist. The, our responsibility is to see these new drugs as not anti-diabetic drugs, but drugs that uh, reduce cardiovascular events. Because if you compare the benefits that you saw in these clinical trials, the benefits are very similar to what we had before with the use of ACE inhibitors or with the use of uh, statins in treating myocardial disease. And actually, this is the new algorithm to treat the patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We start with metformin, but if the patient had diabetes and the cardiovascular disease, you can either choose uh, an SLG2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist and a new field approaches, which is this very interesting data, the, these new trials where we are testing these drugs not to treat diabetes, not in diabetic patients, but for instance in patients with heart failure, both with systolic heart failure or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction to reduce cardiovascular endpoints. And to conclude, I, I conclude with the last, with a sentence with a very famous philosopher which uh, answers to this question. 
if for those who still doubt that we are changing, that we are facing a new paradigm in diabetes treatment, I think, as he usually said, this is a very famous sentence, we have all to start listening to this new music that is playing in this cardiodiabetology field. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ricardo Sandit, uh, and uh, for this uh, very informative, excellent lecture, and also giving uh, cardiologists a new hope uh, in managing their diabetic patients. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you, chairpersons. Next on our agenda, we are going to move on to the lecture on coronary artery surgery, present to future, by Dr. M. Munasinghe. And I invite Dr. A. Yoganad Murthy and Dr. Visna Amaratunga to chair the session. Good morning to all of you. We are moving to the second lecture for the day. So let me invite Dr. Mahendra Munasinghe, an eminent cardiothoracic surgeon, to take you to the horizon of coronary artery surgeries from present to the future. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Desna. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, as we know, ischemic heart disease is the number one killer on the planet. And uh, while managing this with all three forms of uh, uh, managing, all three forms in the management of ischemic heart disease, there are so many recent advances revolution in the management of ischemic heart disease. And out of which I think uh, the recent advances in uh, coronary artery surgery is the least known. So that's why we selected this topic today. So, um, these are the current guidelines, European guidelines, and it's quite similar to the American. And as you can see in this slide, that uh, coronary artery surgery, coronary artery bypass grafting is, is a class one indication in most of the clinical scenarios, and out of which some are the gold standard still. So uh, I'm going to start uh, my talk and I have no conflicts of interest because I'll be showing some commercial products in my uh, talk. And today I'm going to, uh, out of a long list, I'm going to, uh, I have selected uh, four topics, the inflammatory artery, the venous vein graft, mid-cap, and hybrid coronary vascularization. Uh, just to touch on the history of uh, surgery for coronary artery disease, uh, you know, until the middle of last century, people tried lots of weird things, uh, hoping that collaterals will develop into the ischemic myocardium. None of these things worked. But in 1946, a, a surgeon called Arthur Weinberg, uh, he harvested the internal memory artery and buried it in the myocardium, uh, hoping that the collaterals will develop. That also didn't work. But in 1964, in February 1964, uh, a Russian surgeon called Vasily Kolesov, he harvested the internal memory artery and actually anastomosed it to the uh, a lady, the Lima to a lady with a running stitch, which, are, which, is, which has completely revolutionized the management of ischemic heart disease. And a few months after that, one of the greatest surgeons, cardiac surgeons of all time, Michael DeBakey, he, he honest, most, uh, took a piece of vein from the leg and used it as a, as, a, as, a, as a bypass graft, and that took off. And, and coronary artery uh, bypass grafting became very popular. And after, uh, after that, now more than a million uh, coronary artery bypass graftings or cabbages are done in the world today. And what this man did in 1964, was such an important event. I will tell you as, as I go on. 
Uh, the, as you know, the internal mammary artery is a branch of the first part of the subclavian artery, and we housed it with a, with, a, with a pedicle and disconnect it at the bottom end and use it as a graft and anastomose it to the LAD. But it didn't, it didn't take off until 1986. A surgeon called Lou, he noticed that his patients who had an IMA graft, Lima to LAD graft, that they, they did, the patients did much better than the ones we had, uh, once you had, uh, had, had a vein grafts. So he tried to publish his paper. It was rejected repeatedly, but luckily it appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1986. And after that, that became so popular. The Lima to Lady graft is a standard for every patient who undergoes uh, CABG now. Why is such an important thing? Simple. It's, it's, it lasts long. It, it, la it, the patency rate, the 20-year patency rate is more than 90%. It relieves symptoms, reduces the major adverse coronary and cerebrovascular events, reduces the need for repeat revascularization, and most importantly, improves long-term survival. As you can see in this graph, after that initial dip at the early graph failure, the, the, the lima or the internal mammary artery gets stabilized and goes on and on and on while the vein graft patency goes down every year. How does this happen? Because, because of this increased longevity, this graft has been analyzed so much it was un put under the microscope, put under the electron microscope, analyzed biochemically at the cellular level, at the, uh, at the molecular biology level, and this is what we know today. When you take its histology, it has a fantastic endothelium. It has a unique endothelium which shows less fenestrations, lower intercellular junction permeability, and that makes the IMA impervious to the transfer of lipoproteins across the intima. That's how it resists atheromatous degeneration. As we know, endothelium, vascular endothelium is an endocrine organ by itself. One of the functions is to produce nitric oxide. And the internal mammary artery produces the largest amount of nitric oxide out of the 80,000 kilometers of uh, blood vessels that, that have, we have in the human body. And it was such an important discovery. Nitric, well, the, the three scientists who discovered the action of nitric oxide on the blood vessels were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1998. So what does nitrous oxide do? The most important one is vasodilatation. It signals the smooth muscle cells in the media to relax and dilates the vessels. The second one is uh, it inhibits platelet aggregation, thereby reduces a, a graft thrombosis. The other ones, it reduces inflammation on the endothelium, it reduces monocyte addition, reduces smooth muscle cell proliferation, inhibits superoid, superoxide radical elaboration and LDL oxidation. And this is how it resists, mainly resists atherosclerosis. The, my surgical colleagues in this audience will, will agree with me if I say that we almost never see atheroma in an IMA when we, when we harvest. These, in patients with severe aggressive atheroma with, uh, in the aorta, the peripheral vascular disease, uh, carotid artery disease, diffuse coronary artery disease, still, the, uh, when we harvest the IMA, there's no atheroma in it. There are some unique actions on nitric oxide when it is grafted to a coronary. It preserves normal vasomotor coronary physiology, it dilates the coronary artery in its branches, improves myocardial perfusion, makes existing, existing plaques regress. It prevents further plaque formation downstream, induces the formation of collaterals. That's the most important action of nitric oxide. And the main factor behind this is nitric oxide. So what stimulates the endothelium to produce nitric oxide? When there's flow, 
the endothelial cells line in the direction of the blood flow. And nitric oxide synthesis is enhanced by steady lamina flow. The shear stress is the main principal factor, stimulus for it to produce nitric oxide. The effects of, but the effects of nitric oxide is short-lived. But when you have chronic increasing flow, it increases the arterial lumen diameter and increases the flow. And the most important action of that is it induces collateral formation and improves the runoff bed. That's how our patients, when they do rhythmic aerobic exercise, in other words, after surgery, when they keep walking, the flow is increased, they produce nitric oxide, and that's how the, uh, uh, a good runoff bed is formed with the other two systems, that's the circumflex and the right uh, coronary system, and that's how they go on for years. So if, if Lima is so good, there's another one on the other side that has been overlooked and underutilized. So uh, there's a huge trend now to use both internal mammary arteries. And as you can see, we have to, you saw that pedicle IMA, when you're harvesting the second IMA, you have to do it in a skeletalized manner. You can't take a pedicle. There are two advantages in, in, in uh, doing it uh, skeletonized. It reduces the, the devascularization of the sternum, and it gives us uh, length, extra length, so that it can reach the bottom of the heart to the posterior and the inferior coronaries. But the second coronary, uh, the, the, the behavior of the internal mammary artery depends on to which territory you are grafted to. It's best when it's grafted to the LAD, second to the circumflex, and third to the RCA. But it's far more superior to the next best conduit, that's the radial artery, and far more superior than the saphenous vein graft. So in the recent years, there are so many publications, so much of observational studies, meta-analysis, randomized trials appearing on every single journal and shows the advantage of the second internal memory artery use. I have no time to go to all these, and uh, I selected this one, which appeared, where, uh, this article appeared in uh, October 2017 in circulation, and I will read that bottom line for you. Quote, conclusions. Beam of drafting was associated with a reduced risk of repeat revascularization and improvement in long-term survival and should be considered more frequently during coronary artery bypass grafting. How do we do it? You know, that Lima to LDD graft is sacred. You don't touch it. And this is the commonest configuration that we use. We take that second internal memory artery, the right internal memory artery, or RIMA, through the transverse sinus behind the aorta and the pulmonary artery and uh, take it across the midline to the left side and graft it to the circumflex. But there are lots of surgeons doing different, different configurations. They uh, disconnect the rima and anastomose it to the lima and use it as a sequential and composite grafts. And that can actually reach almost the round the heart to the RCA. And there are surgeons who are doing it even here. Uh, uh, there's another interesting thing that has come out because of this. A group of surgeons in Seoul, South Korea, has uh, used a piece of vein to lengthen this. And they've studied that piece of vein over time and geographically. And that piece of vein has behaved completely differently. It has behaved like angiographically, it has resisted atherosclerosis, resisted neointimal hyperplasia, and uh, that's a very exciting thing because it has almost like uh, the vein has been arterialized, probably because of the nitric oxide that is coming downstream. But with all this evidence, sadly, 
only 10% of the European patients and 5% in US and 10% in India get this advantage. So in Sri Lanka, I think it's less than 5%. Are there any contraindications? No, no, there are no contraindications. The, the only major limiting factor is that when you take both mental mammary arteries, you can get deep sternal wound infections, but it's now becoming very rare because we take all the precautions. And the ones who are susceptible to this is obese patients, insulin-dependent diabetics, patients who have COPD, and old age. So I highlighted this insulin-dependent diabetics as we all know, uh, diabetes is a vascular disease. They have endo endothelial dysfunction. They have aggressive atherosclerosis. And they are the very people who will benefit most from bilateral IMA grafting. Who is this? There are lots of people trying to make things great again these days. So our surgeons decided to make our vein grafts great again. Why? Because this is the commonest art, uh, coronary artery conduit that we use for CBG. And that's the biggest problem, long-term problem of CBG. Repeat revascularization and increase incidence of maze. And why it happens? And this is how, how the vein graphs go down over time compared to the lady. Uh, sorry, the Lima. Uh, why will the vein grafts fail has been analyzed like the IMA to improve on ourselves and, and we have found how it fails. Obviously, you can argue that the vein, veins are not designed by nature to carry aortic pressures. But we have, people have analyzed this and this is what we know. Obviously, as soon as you graft it to the aorta and release the clamp, the aortic pressures are transmitted to the vein. And immediately the vein dilates. After some time, after months or the, in the first or the second year, the intimal, there's intimal thickening in the con, with concentric layers of smooth muscle in it, and it undergoes atheromatous degeneration. It causes stenosis and graft, graft occlusion. And what we have found is that this first one, the first, uh, the, the, sorry, the second and the third ones are directly dependent on what happens in the first. So stages that affect the, the vein graphs is that harvesting, when we are testing it, then uh, storing it from, from, from harvesting to, to, uh, to grafting, storage, the target vessel obviously, when we're grafting it, and short-term and long-term care. In the long-term care, the high-dose statins have helped this vein graft so much for its longevity, and, uh, and studies have shown when you keep the LDL levels less than 70, it really helps to increase the longevity of the vein grafts. So for, to overcome this dilatation, an external stent has been ha introduced is available commercially. And what we know is that the vein, veins are not uniform like arteries. It's, it doesn't have a smooth contour. When there's turbulence in this, that is exactly where the new intimal hyperplasia and atheroma is accelerated. So this device, it's a titanium mesh that you put, a tube that you put around the vein that pushes the, uh, the vein against this vest and makes it smooth flow. And you can see the one on the, uh, uh, on the top left, uh, you can see the one without the vest and below in the vest, uh, with the vest. And there's so much of studies going on about this uh, device. It's commercially available, FDA approved. And uh, there's a lot of studies done about the storage solution, mainly done at the Stanford University. And it shows the storage solution affects the endothelial function. And for that, uh, a, a solution has been uh, introduced. And it is commercially available. It is widely used. And it shows a lot of promise. And is available to us in Sri Lanka now. It got NRMA registration. 
The only limiting factor is the cost. It costs about 60,000 rupees per patient. Out of, out of the uh, things that we use for the vein graft, this shows the most amount of promise. As I said earlier, harvesting affects, the way you harvest the vein affects the longevity of the vein. The, if you damage the intima, if you rough on the vein, if you push and pull and dissect the vein, that affects the, uh, the, the vein graft patency. So as the name implies, we don't, in this technique, we don't go anywhere near the vein. We take it with a pedicle, with a sheath around it, and that has shown to increase the vein graft patency. And a lot of studies have shown that it really helps to increase the patency. And microscopically also, it shows that it does uh, reduce the endothelial damage. It uh, reduces the trauma and mechanical damage, prevents over distension, reduces the initial over distension, preserves the smooth muscle contour, reduces smooth muscle cell activation, acts as an external stent, preserves vasovasorum, preserves vasomotor nerves, and it prevents kinking. That really helps the vein. Endoscopic harvesting has gone out of fashion now because, as I said earlier, this causes damage or trauma to the vein. Uh, minimal invasive direct coronary artery bypass is addressing one of the, the if not the biggest criticism of uh, CBG because it's a, it's a big uh, operation, traumatic operation. And it is done with a small incision on the left chest, on the force intercostal space, is done on, uh, on uh, um, off pump technique. And there are lots of advantages uh, for this but uh, is mainly helpful in patients with single vessel disease with isolated LAD lesion. Hybrid, this is a new technique that we are using now. Is it gives our patients the, the advantage of to LAD graft and the minimal invasiveness of PCI. And uh, it's best done for to LAD lesions and an unisolated lesion on the, on the other two systems. And it can be done in three ways. Uh, simultaneously, cardiologists, uh, interventional cardiologists and the surgeon in, the, in a hybrid operating theater. And uh, it can be done uh, in stages, mid-cap first and the PCI second, and PCI first and mid-cap second. And to conclude, I would like to show this picture. Surgeons and interventional cardiologists working together. Now, out of all the scientific advancements that's changing our practice, I think this is something new, not new, but, but is improved cooperation between non-interventional, interventional cardiologists and the surgeons. And that helps to achieve our goals, one, to save lives, two, to relieve symptoms and improve their quality of life, and the most importantly, to make them live longer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Munasinga, for that excellent lecture about the CABG. And, uh, small token of appreciation from Sri Lanka Heart Association for you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And next will be a symposium on heart failure. We invite Dr. Prakash Priyadarshan and Dr. Suresh Kote Goda to chair the session.
Our next symposium is going to be on heart failure. To kick things off, I would like to I'd like to invite Dr. Robert Gerber. Uh, to t tell us about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Over to you, Dr. Gerber. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, I'm delighted to be invited here today to the 18th uh, Annual Symposium in Colombo. And my topic is to talk about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's actually quite a difficult topic. And the reason I show this is that these patients are actually on the, on the, uh, on the edge. Um, for some time, we've focused on patients with low ejection fraction. And if you attend the cardiology wards, usually the second or third thing your physician colleagues will ask you is, what's the ejection fraction? Uh, patients got heart failure, always got low ejection fraction. And that al almost always triggers a um, protocol in your mind of how you can treat these patients. Um, but if the ejection fraction is normal and they've got heart failure, then actually that becomes quite difficult because we've been conditioned to react into low ejection fraction. The guidelines are like that. But in fact, the patient, as I'll show you, with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure is as vulnerable as the one with low ejection fraction. They're literally hanging on. So what I want to uh, do is um, go through the, um, some of the data, but also some of the clinical important things that you need to bear in mind in patients that have got heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, because a big part of this is using your clinical acumen and understanding the clinical syndrome of heart failure with preserved, preserved ejection fraction, because then that ha helps with your management options, because it isn't just one particular thing. And as in most things in medicine, if it is not uh, dichotomous, in other words, if it's not zero or one, then things become complicated. We're gonna go through some of the mechanisms involved that we're aware of, some of the treatment options, uh, there are some options, and then some of the management plans. There's a task force that's recently been updated on um, heart failure, and I just want to um, draw your attention to the fact now that there are three types of heart failure that we, re um, that we are aware of. There's the heart failure with um, reduced ejection fraction, um, there's heart failure with moderately reduced ejection fraction, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is I'm gonna focus on today, and the other uh, talks in the session will speak about the other entity. So really, if you've got patients uh, with suspected uh, uh, HEF-PEF, then what you need to do is go through the clinical history, and this is in the guidance. I think this is important because there are various things that are quite useful. The first thing is, is coronary artery disease. Um, quite often, this is overlooked. Uh, you need to look at the history, the um, presentation, and then the physical signs. Do they have rails, do they have ankle edema? Is there a heart murmur? Quite a lot of HEF-PEF patients have coexisting or have had aortic valve surgery. Look at the ECG. And then there are some serological tests that can help. Depending on the laboratory in your hospital, you can do an NT pro-BMP. If it's greater than one, two, five, then you should be concerned, or BMP greater than 35. If, however, all of these things are negative, then you need to stand by your ground. And this patient's symptoms are not related to heart failure. Quite often, patients have seen cardiologists for some time with pulmonary disease and labeled as heart failure. So it's actually quite difficult when you've got a normal ejection fraction to di some, diagnose someone with heart failure or type of heart failure. But you must do that because it has an important implication. 
So we're quite obsessed with ejection fraction, but to be honest, it's actually quite a crude measure, as we know. The majority of the time, uh, we will do a visual assessment, and there may be some, uh, uh, obviously this is the equation for measuring the heart failure, uh, sorry, the ejection fraction. And if you look at the uh, healthy subjects, um, this was the Heart of England screening test, you will see that patients that don't even have symptoms do have evidence of uh, reduced ejection fraction. I think what, you, what is clear from this is that patients, as they get older, tend to have worsening heart function. The other thing is, is there's a, a difference in the gender. Um, the dark bars represent men of various ages, and uh, sorry, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, and the, and the gray bars are women. And I think you can clearly see there is a bimodal distribution with a shift um, to the right for ladies. I think that would confirm most people's clinical impression that HEFPEF tends to be something that you would uh, see in ladies. So going back to the three classifications, you get cardiac structural remodeling. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the echocardiographic uh, um, indices, associated left atrial dilatation, as a consequence, we do see um, some atrial fibrillation and left ventricular hypertrophy. And then you have this sort of functional diastolic dysfunction that we talk about as a raised E over E prime that I'm sure most of you are aware of. So if you look at the heart, um, the top panel really is something that uh, if, you, if you look at the LV pressure, so the normal heart reduced and increased. And with impaired relaxation, there's a problem in the, um, um, the ability for the heart in diastole, and you see a lengthening of the uh, IV artery. This then with time as the heart gets stiffer and relaxes less, increases, and you see in the mitral inflow the E wave starting to increase. And in fact, you can get the pseudo-normal picture. So quite often my registrars will say, oh, well, look, the mitral inflow Doppler looks fine but actually it's not because the heart has gone from the impaired relaxation phase where the E over E prime is lower to a pseudo-normal phase. If you don't treat early, then this progresses and you see a sort of restrictive filling pattern. Actually, tissue Doppler is very helpful for this because you can look at a peak systolic wave, which is the SM, and then an E over A. And as you see from uh, these lines, as the E wave increases from the mitral inflow Doppler, uh, the E uh, M decreases. And so actually you get an increase in this value. I'll show you some of the figures um, that you should be looking for. And again, this is in the guidelines, so you can get this table. And essentially, if you have a ratio of greater than 8 or 10, depending on where you're measuring it, then you can fairly confidently, with the clinical picture, diagnose diastolic heart failure or hef -pef. So the um, echo on the left is a healthy heart, supple heart that relaxes. I think you'd agree on the right, this is the sort of picture you would see with somebody with um, hef -pef. concentric LV8, left atrial size is starting to dilate. And really visually you can see that the heart doesn't relax as well. What about the pathophysiology? So as I said at the beginning, the pathophysiology of HEFPEF is multifactorial. It's not just diastolic dysfunction. There's abnormal vasodilatation. We heard on the previous lecture the importance of um, endothelial function, nitric oxide. That can be associated with a raised LVEDB, secondary pulmonary hypertension, also known as post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. And quite often, chronotropic incompetence and poor heart rate variability uh, is overlooked. And so these factors affect all the organs in the body. Um, you get fluid retention in the kidneys, venous congestion, which can lead to renal impairment, oliguria, further hypertension. So it's almost uh, uh, like a sort of a, a feed forward process. The skeletal muscle with endothelial dysfunction gets impaired metabolism. Uh, 
impaired peripheral vasodilatation. So these patients report reduced exercise capacity. The lungs, you, as I mentioned, you can get secondary pulmonary hypertension and impaired respiratory muscle function. And so the combination is, is a patient that feels as though their exercise capacity is down and increased dyspnea. And on top of this, you get, uh, 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 and it's important to bear in mind, abdominal and uh, GI um, manifestations of venocongestion, um, which leads to gut flora uh, transvocation and some endotoxin-mediated inflammatory responses. So these patients just generally are, uh, have a multi-systemic um, uh, 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 unwell. If you look at the mechanism for diastolic dysfunction and look at the myocardial filaments, essentially the circa, if you remember back to the, uh, your um, basic science days, the circa pump, which is here in the middle, is in fact the thing that's upregulated. And so, uh, and you get sensitization of the M and Z bands in the myofilament. And so therefore you see this kind of hyperdynamic situation, which is why uh, when we look at treatment strategies, it can be uh, for um, looking at these particular um, uh, molecules. So Hitton Patel, one of our registrars, nicely uh, uh, published uh, um, in the European Journal of Heart Failure, a group of patients, if you look, um, that we filter down. So how, you know, what is the prevalence of true heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? And what you see is that most of the patients with heart failure are your classical patients with low ejection fraction that we would treat. But within the first filter, you'd see that around 22% have a high ejection fraction. And then if you further look at these particular patients, they fall into the categories that clinically you see uh, in your clinics and on the wards. They tend to be the elderly patient. Uh, they tend to have had some form of uh, valvular heart disease and they have real impairment. So I guess that comes as no surprise. But when you look at it like this, it helps with uh, identifying these patients that could be missed in terms of treatment options. So there's loads of different phenotypes, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of these. So elderly, the aging process within the myocardium. Quite often you have COPD. We heard in the first lecture today about diabetes and how diabetes has an important interrelation with cardiovascular disease and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Some of these patients have sleep apnea, all of which um, are treat treatable. And something that most people don't tend to look at in their clinical history is previous chemotherapy or radiotherapy. And I'll show you a little bit of data on this that I think will uh, produce some interest. They may have had myocardial infarction and remodeling. And then infiltrative cardiomyopathy, such as amyloid, sarcoid, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the commonly most misinherited uh, cardiomyopathy. And then a, a reverse remodeling process in somebody that's had uh, heart failure with, with uh, reduced ejection fraction occasionally is very rarely seen. So let's have a look at uh, heart failure uh, in women that have had um, breast cancer. And this is a, a, an interesting study, and I think it does highlight some of the other mechanisms that's responsible for the myocardial fibrosis. If you look at the radiation dose in grey uh, from 1 to 14, um, just to give you an idea, um, if you were to have a, uh, a radiated patient in the cath lab over one gray, you'd be concerned. Um, long CTO procedures, you'd be lucky if they went up to two gray. What you can see in the top right-hand panel is patients with left and right-sided breast tumors. And in this particular trial, they looked at the case control mix between ladies that had uh, breast cancer uh, and their equivalent control based on these uh, variables, which was in a hierarchical uh, matched process. So I, I guess it's a pseudo for randomization because obviously you couldn't randomize somebody to have radiation or not. What's interesting is that as you increase the dose in gray, you see more heart failure cases. So the exposure to the heart first day of radiotherapy or chemotherapy does in fact produce heart failure. And if you were to look at the patients in particular that have ischemic heart disease or atrial fibrillation, 
to almost 100, well, 100% of them have had high doses. So this is quite relevant. And so if you do see somebody that has, ha has had PEP, you should ask, have you had previous chemotherapy or um, radiotherapy? So the last five minutes, I'm just going to talk about how we should treat this. Um, there are a whole load of trials, and uh, I'm not really going to go um, in detail to talk about each one. But the bottom line is, when you look at the Fisher's plot for most of the studies, they're slightly disappointing in the fact that they all tend to cross unity. Some have wide confidence intervals, and so you would have thought uh, intuitively that beta blockers, particularly vasodilator beta blockers such as nabivalol, would have had a positive effect. Similarly, aldosterone antagonists you would have hoped would have produced some benefit. And our usual ARB-ACE combination inhibiting the RAS system you would have also hoped would have, would have helped the uh, uh, treatment here. But unfortunately, none of these trials have been positive. And sildenafil, uh, in the relaxed trial, you'd have thought, yes, maybe even that would have caused some benefit, but it doesn't. So why is that? Well, actually, it's because of various things. As you saw from the filter diagram, it's very difficult to actually recruit these patients. And so quite a lot of these patients actually had more the kind of moderate ejection fraction. Um, some of the drug some of the patients were already on these drugs at randomization, so it wasn't really a clear group. It wasn't a clean group. Um, also, as despite them being in trials, the doses were suboptimal. Many patients didn't really get up to proper inhibitory doses that one would, need, would, would require. And so essentially, they're underpowered, which is why I wanted to show the Fisher plot, because if you see such a wide confidence interval, that raises some suspicion. And so really, I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as we say. These drugs do have a role, and you just have to be careful that the evidence isn't just there right now. We're doing a study. Um, if, if, uh, for those of you that are here yesterday, I mentioned that renal denervation has had a resurgence, and actually we're doing a study in renal denervation as a randomized trial, both in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction, and I'm hopeful that it, will show, it may show some benefits. There is some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there is, a, what, there is um, um, slowing the heart rate down, as you would have thought, uh, would have a benefit, beneficial effect. And in fact, the use of evabradina, reasonably high dose, did have a, uh, a significant uh, outcome. And so the recommendations really are that patients should be screened. Uh, this is from the European guidelines. And that the treatment of choice, which is a 1B diuretic. So it's not so easy. You know, where is X? Here it is. Well, not really. You know, just because you've got a patient with uh, hef -pef, oh, it's due to hypertension. It's not necessarily the case. And I think I've demonstrated that you need to um, exclude all the options. What else do we have? Spironolactone, I mentioned in the top cat trial, it's a reasonable large number of patients with a target dose of 30 versus placebo, and the primary endpoint of CB mortality, aborted cardiac arrest, and hospitalization, hospitalization didn't show any difference. Um, but the patients that had high markers, uh, so serum BMP, benefited the most. And I think this is something that you need to look at in these trials, to so look at this subgroup. Um, that would get benefit and tailor that to your clinical practice. Also, there was a large amount of geographical variation in this trial in TopCat. Um, Two-thirds of the uh, uh, patients in the U.S. were enrolled on BMP, whereas in Russia, they, were involved, uh, they, they weren't involved, uh, enrolled on a BMP. Uh, and so, therefore, that confuses, really, what we see in the results. These are the sort of patients that you will see that you should be aware of. So elderly patients that are female, that have dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia hypertension, and diabetes. And you can see the p-values compared to the other categories are quite significant. So how do you treat hypertension in the elderly? Remember when we were 
at medical school, we were told that you can have a systolic of 120 plus your age. We know that's a nonsense. Um, and so actually what you should be doing is aggressively treating these elderly patients, for, mainly with indapamide and frindipril. And you can see significant benefit using both agents. We also heard a lecture yesterday about ACE inhibitors. Uh, I, put, I put, put this slide in just to show that ACE inhibitors, the panel on the left, uh, if you, if the, has an overall net benefit that isn't as well manifest with ARBs. So if you do want to treat somebody, then go with the evidence. ACE is the first, it's cheaper. If it's tolerated, stick with it. So we do have some benefits there. We heard about using the uh, empagloxin in diabetics, and there was a benefit in, the, uh, in its use in diabetics in reducing heart failure admission. And so in the guidelines, it, it does come in as a 2AB recommendation. So if you've got diabetes, then we do have some treatment options. What about the CHARM studies? Remember all the CHARM studies uh, using candesartan. And just to move on, unfortunately, candesartan didn't show any benefit. Uh, it did in the other forms of heart failure. So just to finish, um, treat the patient clinically. Use diuretics. Spironolactone, I think, with BMP elevation is, does have some use. Don't forget to use indapamide in the elderly. ACE inhibitor is preferable for me based on the HIAT trial. And then empagloxin for diabetics. Look for chronotropic incompetence with tapes, exclude ischemia, and target your comorbidities. So it isn't one disease. And I think I've shown you today that there are several things that you can do to help your patients. Uh, uh, and um, if, you, if you target disease-specific strategies, um, then uh, you can get good outcomes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gerber, for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, due to sake of time, we keep the question time as the end of the symposium. Uh, so we'd like to call upon the next speaker, uh, Professor Andrew Boy. His topic is art failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction. Thank you, and thanks again for inviting me. Okay, heart failure, as we all know, is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. And I think it's interesting to begin with a historical look at treatments for heart failure. And in the first edition of Harrison's Principles and Practice of Internal Medicine in the 1950s, the treatments are listed there, and they, it's, it's the four Ds, decubitus or, or, or bed rest, dietary sodium restriction, digitalis, mercury-based diuretics, as well as venesection and morphine. And by the 1970s, we actually had some uh, much more up-to-date treatments. By the sixth edition of that same textbook, we had thiazide diuretics, loop diuretics, and potassium-sparing diuretics. Beta agonists probably weren't beneficial. We now know that beta block aids the treatment for heart failure. And a concept emerged of treating the underlying cause of heart failure that it was a manifestation rather than the primary problem. So if you look at those, we actually do still do quite a lot of those things. Bed rest, diuretics, digitalis, and uh, venous action not so much, but after load reduction in other, in other ways. None of those have been shown to prolong life, but they are symptomatic treatments. Nowadays, we tend to classify things a lot more than in those days. The ACC AHA staging is an is a, is a important framework to be thinking about heart failure, where stage A is patients at risk for developing heart failure, patients with hypertension, coronary disease, diabetes, and those sorts of things. Stage B is asymptomatic LV dysfunction, and that may be from previous myocardial infarction or valvular disease. Stage C is symptomatic heart failure with LV impairments, and stage D is refractory end-stage heart failure. And if you look along the right of this image, the Olmsted County study from Minnesota looked at adults over the age of 45 years, and you'll see that an established diagnosis of heart failure was about 12%. But the majority of patients are in stage A or B, meaning they're at risk of heart failure, or they have asymptomatic LV dysfunction already, which is, which is quite alarming for those of us in that age bracket. 
Uh, and, and normals were, were just under a third of the population, the adult population. In parallel with the staging, there's the symptomatic classification that you all know, New York Heart Association class one through four, which is important in monitoring patients. And we're seeing a real change in the pattern of disease from the last century now with coronary artery disease incidence and death rates falling, but heart failure incidence is increasing in many countries. We know the survival is terrible with advanced heart failure. So patients in New York Heart Association functional class four have a prognosis akin to disseminate, many disseminated cancers. Now in heart failure, there are several compensatory mechanisms which the heart and the rest of the body um, produce to try and improve uh, cardiac function. The first is the Frank Starling mechanism and that relates to stretch of a myocyte. And when you stretch muscle, it contracts more vigorously. And we extrapolate that up to the organ level in the heart. You'll notice in that figure, when you load the ventricle, i.e. increase end diastolic volume along the x-axis, you get an increase in stroke volume on the y-axis but only up to a certain point, and there's an inflection point for everybody where the heart no longer is able to increase contractility and it starts to fail. Myocardial hypertrophy is an attempt for the heart to prevent this remodeling and dilatation. And so cardiomyocytes hypertrophy to prevent um, dilatation. And if we go back to the physics of this, and I promise only one slide on physics, the law of Laplace dictates that left ventricular wall stress is dependent on the pressure within the ventricle and the size of the ventricle or the radius. And it's inversely proportional to the wall thickness. So that's the only formula I'll show. But if you think about that, increasing the wall thickness will reduce the wall stress and reducing the volume and the pressure in the ventricle will also reduce the wall stress. Now wall stress not only drives the ventricle to structural remodeling and dilatation, but it also increases the tension in the myocardium and reduces blood flow, rendering the myocardium ischemic and dysfunctional and increasing the end diastolic pressure further. So it's a vicious cycle like many things in cardiology. Outside the heart, the rest of the body also creates vicious cycles to compensate for cardiac dysfunction. Decreased cardiac output is seen by the kidneys as reduced renal perfusion, which stimulates the release of renin and stimulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which causes sodium and water retention, vasoconstriction, all of which worsen cardiac function. So this is where most of our therapies for hef ref um, occur. So if we think about this through the stages that I mentioned of the um, ACC, AHA staging system for heart failure, it'll tell us an approach to patients within those stages. So we go through stage A, B, C, and D. Stage B and C may be asymptomatic or start to develop symptoms in stage C and symptoms at rest in stage D. Okay, so let's talk about treatment. Stage A is patients at risk. These are patients with hypertension, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and all the risk factors that we know about. So what can we do? In stage A, it's risk factor modification. So treat blood pressure, get patients to lose weight, optimize diabetes, avoid cardiotoxins like alcohol, um, and you may want to screen patients at this stage if they're at very high risk with a BNP or an echo. Once patients have overt cardiac structural disease in the absence of symptoms, and we're talking here about patients with a previous MI, previous ACS, uh, patients with LVH or asymptomatic valvular disease, then what can we do? Well, if patients have a low ejection fraction, it's quite reasonable to start treating with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, even in the absence of symptoms, beta blockers as well, statins for vascular disease, and we want to avoid calcium channel blockers in this situation. Once patients are in stage C, they're now symptomatic with LV dysfunction. Okay, so we know who these patients are. We've got lots of data. This is where all the positive clinical trials are. This is, I guess, the easy bit. So ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers if they're intolerant, beta blockers, loop diuretics to control volume and symptoms, aldosterone blockade if they remain symptomatic. Uh, hydralazine and nitrates have proven benefit in clinical trials in the African-American population who are symptomatic, and digoxin may reduce hospitalizations but not mortality. 
Stage D is refractory heart failure, and these patients require advanced, advanced therapies. So they, they may require inotropes in the intensive care setting, evaluation for transplantation in selected patients, mechanical circulatory support in some patients, um, but routine inotropes have not so far been found to be effective in this group. Okay, so the, this algorithm from the uh, European Heart Association, uh, ESC guidelines, I'm sorry, is a little bit hard to read on my screen. I hope you can read it there. Uh, you may be familiar with this, but this is a stepwise algorithm for treatment of patients with uh, HEF-REF. And what it says is if you have a patient with HEF-REF, you begin therapy, the first green box you may not be able to read, begin therapy with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and up titrate to the evidence-based dose. Okay, so we know that, we know the trials, we know how to do that. If they are not symptomatic, you exit the algorithm and go down to the bottom, no further action required, and consider reducing the diuretic dose when they are uh, volume controlled. But if they're still symptomatic, we go down the algorithm further and we add a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. Respironolactone is the most common. If they're still symptomatic and their ejection fraction remains low, less than 35%, then there are several things to do, and we'll go through that part of the algorithm step by step. But you'll notice longitudinally, it says diuretics to reduce symptoms and signs of congestion, and so you do that and titrate that as the patient needs throughout their journey. Um, and if ejection fraction remains less than 35%, uh, implant an ICD. Okay, so prevention of sudden death, and we'll get to that in the next talk, I won't touch on that. So when we talk about drugs, we've gone from palliation in the 1950s and 1970s to real mortality reduction. And over the course of the last, uh, since 1991, I guess in this slide, ACE inhibitors have reduced uh, mortality. The addition of beta blockers to ACE inhibitors have further reduced that, and then mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. So in, in 20 years, we've halved the mortality with these evidence-based treatments. And that's why the guidelines give them each a class one indication level of evidence A, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists for those who remain symptomatic. Okay, so I think I might skip the CRT thing here because we'll hear about that in the next talk. Um, and talk about uh, this third box where patients who are in sinus rhythm, who are still symptomatic with a low EF, but on maximal tolerated beta blockade have not achieved a heart rate of under 70 beats per minute. And the SHIFT study, which uh, randomized these, this group of patients to placebo or evabridine, showed an 18% relative risk reduction um, of the combined uh, primary endpoint. There was a 1% all-cause mortality reduction which failed to reach significance, um, but significant reduction in hospitalization. And so in the current guidelines, that gets a 2A recommendation level of evidence B, for patients who continue to have a heart rate above 70 beats per minute. And Arnie's, I guess in, in HEFREF, this is the area of excitement in the last few years, angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors. Okay. So what is this? Uh, this, is a, this is a combination drug, Secubitril and Valsartan. So Secubitril is a neprilysin inhibitor and if you look at this diagram, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, but neprilysin breaks down the natriuretic peptides. And by inhibiting this, you have the beneficial effects of more circulating natriuretic peptides. Um, it also blocks the breakdown of angiotensin II, so you need to add, add an angiotensin receptor blocker in with that. And this combined inhibition in patients who are established on ACE beta blocker and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist um, changing the ACE inhibitor to the combination of Secubitril and Valsartan further reduced um, the primary endpoint by 20% and importantly reduced mortality by 16%. And so the current ESC guidelines, class one indication, level of evidence B, replacing ACE inhibitors with Secubitril Valsartan to further reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and death in patients who remain symptomatic despite optimal treatment with ACE beta blocker and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. Okay. So it's a switch from ACE inhibitor to uh, Entresto. Uh, some important caveats. The initial starting dose um, is 49, 51 milligrams and the dose should be doubled as tolerated. Have to have a blood pressure above 100 and an EGFR of greater than 30 mils per minute. Uh, 
Um, potassium must be less than 5.4. And it's important that there's a washout period. There's a real risk of angioedema if you add this drug on top of an ACE inhibitor. Um, so a washout period of three days is important and it's contraindicated if you've had angioedema to ACE inhibitors. So those are all the things to do, but the guidelines also recommend some things not to do in HEFREF. Uh, so trials have shown that um, a non-invasive ventilation or CPAP overnight for central sleep apnea is not beneficial and may be harmful. Uh, thiazolidine diodes or the glitazones have been shown to worsen the risk of heart failure. So diabetics with HEFREF should not receive these drugs. And we should avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and COX-2 inhibitors as they increase the risk for worsening heart failure and hospitalization. A couple of special comorbidities in, in HEFREF. Those who have iron deficiency anemia. This was a randomized controlled trial of ferrous carboxymaltose infusion and it showed a 61% reduction in time to first heart failure hospitalization. So treating iron deficiency in HEFREF is really important in improving symptoms and reducing hospitalization. And this is now a class 2A recommendation. And it's only with uh, the ferrous carboxymaltose. We don't know that other iron preparations actually work. Um, but if you don't have the carboxymaltose preparation, it's probably reasonable to use other iron supplementation protocols. Uh, diabetes. So uh, we've seen this slide already today, but uh, hospitalization for heart failure is substantially reduced with empagliflozin, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Diabetes drugs seem to be getting harder and harder to pronounce these days. Um, so that's now a 2A recommendation, level of evidence B, based on the Empareg study. Okay, so when all of that's not enough, and there still is a substantial burden of symptoms, hospitalization, and death in this patient uh, cohort, then it's time to consider cardiac transplantation. If you think about this in the context of the history, this was first performed in 1967 under very controversial circumstances where Christian Barnard trained with Shumway at Stanford and then rushed back home to South Africa and, and did the first transplant. But it was 1967, and that was the era of mercury-based diuretics and venesection with none of the treatments that we currently have. And the first patient only lived for 16 days, but that was hailed as a great success. There was a worldwide um, fervor for heart transplantation at that time. And in the United States, the first pediatric heart transplant was just a few days later, but not, not quite as successful, only living six hours. Uh, and since that time, the operations uh, have improved, the immunosuppressive, immunosuppressive agents have improved, and the survival's improved uh, substantially. And there are now about 3,500 transplants annually uh, per year worldwide. And I'm led to believe that you've started your transplant program in Sri Lanka and I would like to congratulate you as a cardiology community. That's a, a fantastic advance for your patients, so well done. This looks at the survival over, over the, uh, several generations. So from the 80s, 90s, uh, the five-year survival was approximately 65% now. In the more modern era, about 75%. So a 10% improvement in survival over the last couple of decades is really quite remarkable. The ESC guidelines um, say patients to consider are those with end-stage heart failure and severe symptoms, bad prognosis, and no remaining alternative treatments. They need to be motivated, well-informed, and emotionally stable. It is difficult, once you've survived a transplant, to put up with the immunosuppressive protocol, the constant biopsy, and, and follow-up. It's not easy to do, and they must be capable of complying with the intensive treatment required postoperatively. There are a number of contraindications which we probably don't need to go through uh, in the interest of time. Um, but suffice it to say is that the um, contraindications are becoming less strict over time. Um, the BMI cutoff is now 35 in the guidelines instead of 30. EGFR is 30 instead of 40. And patients over 70 now go on a regular waiting list in many countries. HIV and hepatitis C are no longer contraindications as they're manageable long-term diseases. I might just move through that. Uh, another option for the uh, advanced heart failure end-stage symptomatic patient is mechanical circulatory support. And there are several options here. ECMO, e extracorporeal membrane oxygenator, takes blood out of the um, right atrium through the femoral vein, has a pump and an oxygenator, and delivers it back into the arterial system through the femoral artery. Uh, percutaneous VADs, or ventricular assist devices, and there are 
number of these on the market and the number is growing each year. But the ones that I've shown there on the left are the impeller, which is a comp one arterial access 13 French um, uh, pigtail catheter with an impeller motor that drives blood from the left ventricle to the aorta. And on the right there is the tandem heart, which is arterial and venous. It takes blood from the left atrium via a transeptal puncture through the venous system uh, to an external pump and puts it back into the aorta via the femoral artery uh, without oxygenating it. So those two are just pumps. And then there's the implantable LVAD, which is um, a surgically implanted device which can be used as a destination therapy or as a bridge to transplantation. Okay, so what are the indications for mechanical circulatory support? Uh, as a bridge to transplant, so if there's not an organ available and you want to keep the patient alive until there is an organ available, that's a bridge to transplant. Bridge to recovery, so patients who have fulminant myocarditis, for example, who are expected to recover but are in intractable cardiogenic shock, it's reasonable to put them on a, a ventricular assist device and await recovery. Destination therapy, the pumps have got so good these days that patients can live years on these pumps and when patients can't get out of hospital, that's a, that's a much better option. Uh, bridge to decision or bridge to bridge are a bit more controversial. Patients who um, are in, in extremis and you just put them on a pump until you can make a decision to take them off the pump or go for transplant. And I think we're running uh, a little bit out of time. But um, we can look at a couple of the pumps here. And if you look at the evolution of these pumps, that one of the earlier heart mates, you'll see on the left x-ray, it's a massive device and that's uh, uh, implanted in the abdomen. Um, and it's much smaller now, the heart mate two, you can see the inflow from the left ventricle, the pump with the uh, red writing there, and then the outflow goes back into the aorta. You can't see that tube. Um, and the survival is much, much better. If you look at the survival with medical therapy versus uh, in green versus the blue line with continuous flow LVAD, it's a substantial improvement in survival in these end-stage patients. Uh, this is the HVAD from Heartware, where the pump is on the inflow cannula. So that's implanted on the right panel, you can see, into the left ventricle. So that mechanical tube uh, is the inflow cannula to the pump, and then you can't see the outflow, which still goes into the aorta. And this one, the only external component of this is the battery pack. Um, so. uh, you can have two VADs, a right ventricle and a left ventricular assist device, uh, sometimes for severe biventricular failure. And uh, this is a patient who had a bivad and um, walked into clinic awake and alert with this ECG. Um, and you can see it's a continuous flow vad, so the uh, cardiac output is five liters per minute until such a time as a cardioversion uh, shock was delivered. And you can see some return of pulsatile flow from the patient's own cardiac function return there. But patients can walk around in VF uh, with these devices in. Uh, the future, devices are getting smaller and smaller. Um, and probably, I think the best, uh, the most important thing is this transcutaneous uh, battery charger to remove the need for external battery packs, which is a nidus for infection. So I'll stop there and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Boyle, for that very comprehensive talk. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Bogdan Nuja to discuss about device therapy in heart failure. Good morning, and thank you for a very generous invitation to speak on cardiac devices in heart failure. It is also my first trip to Sri Lanka, so thank you. And yesterday I had a wonderful um, trip to Kandy, and although I could spend some time initiating discussions on that, my primary task really is on cardiac devices. I was very privileged to have help set up a cardiac devices service in Gloucestershire in the UK, which is now um, 10 year old um, and we are a high implanting center. Firstly, I want to clarify, cardiac resynchronization therapy means biventricular pacing. If the device delivering therapy is a simple pacemaker which resynchronizes the heart, we refer to it as a CRTP device. 
If on the other hand, it has the capability to deliver shocks or treat by antitachycardia pacing, we refer to it as a biventricular ICD or a CRTD. And if we could play the first clip, please. This is a typical example of a failing left ventricle. And what we can see is a ventricle that's underperforming, so it's weak, it has dilated in order to compensate, and it is very significantly mechanically desynchronous. And you will see that there are three main elements to mechanical desynchrony. Firstly, the interventricular desynchrony, which refers to the left ventricle being out of sync to the right ventricle. Secondly, the intraventricular desynchrony, which is the lack of synchrony between the septum and the lateral wall of the left ventricle. And thirdly, the AV desynchrony, which refers to the lack of atrioventricular synchrony, uh, particularly in patients with PR prolongation. Of course, we don't refer to it as first degree heart block. It's a misnomer, there is no block. The mechanical desynchrony is essentially driven by the electrical desynchrony, and on the right-hand side, you will see the ECG showing left bundle branch block with a very broad QRS. So we refer to the whole concept as electromechanical desynchrony. This is what left bundle branch block accounts for. If we could please play the first clip on the left. So left bundle branch block leads to a significant delay in depolarizing the left ventricle. And what that means is that the total cardiac output may go down by an extra 20 to 25 percent. Now, in you and me, that would be probably tolerated, but in a patient with a pre-existing left ventricular dysfunction, a loss of 20 to 25 percent of the cardiac output will matter. And my advice is if, if you're dealing with a patient with stable heart failure who suddenly decompensates, do an ECG, you may find that they may have developed atrial fibrillation, but you may find that they have developed left bundle branch block, which is why they decompensated. And now if we could please play the clip on the right, you will see that cardiac resynchronization aims to resynchronize the right and the left ventricles by stimulating the left ventricle at the same time as the right ventricle. Now, of course, although we enjoy implanting devices and um, we derive immense satisfaction from doing so, it would be completely inappropriate to talk about CRT without at least mentioning the fundamentals of treating heart failure with medication, and particularly not with Professor Boyle in the room. Could I dream about talking about CRT without mentioning medication? We know from the original heart failure trials, which were run in the 80s and published in the early 90s, that ACE inhibitors confer significant and consistent mortality benefit. We also know that in the absence of treatment, the mortality, for example, after a myocardial infarction can be as high as 10, 10 to 30%. And we also know that approximately 50% of those deaths at 12 months may be arrhythmic in nature. Beta blocker trials followed in the late 90s, and I will briefly mention the CBIS-2 trial, which studied carvedilol in heart failure. It showed a significant mortality benefit. And the same year, MERIT heart failure, MERIT HF trial was published with very similar findings, but it also showed a um, decrease in the arrhythmic mortality due to the antiarrhythmic properties of beta blockers. 
The same year, we had the Rawls trials, which studied spironolactone, which conferred extra benefit, mortality benefit, on top of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. It is clear from many trials that amiodron does not affect outcome in heart failure. We use it. We use it for patients with devices who present with VT storms. We use it for secondary prevention in patients who are not suitable for devices. But amiodron does not work in primary prevention of arrhythmia. It does not save lives. Of course, we use diuretics and we use digoxin, but they do not have mortality benefit. They make patients feel better, however. How about CRT? Um, without going into too many details on the CRT data, we had companion trial, which was published in 2004, which enrolled 1,500 patients with heart failure, NYHA class three and four, with a broad QRS in a one to two to two fashion, referring to medication, golden standard, CRTP and CRTD. The primary endpoint was time to death of any cause, or unexplained, um, uh, 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 hospitalization um, for an unexpected event. The secondary endpoint was death of any cause. Of course, the primary endpoint was reached. The results were replicated by the now landmark heart failure trial, Care HF, run by Professor Cleveland in the UK. Again, it enrolled less patients. It enrolled 800 patients with heart failure, NYHA class three and four, with broad QRS complex. The primary endpoint was again time to uh, death of any cause or unexpected hospitalization. But it also, uh, I forgot to mention, a care HF did not have a defibrillator arm. This was medication versus CRTP. But the secondary endpoint was mortality and it was reached um, with quite some significance. So incontestably, by this stage, we learned, this is 2004-2005, that CRT works. Now I hear you ask, does it work with non-left bundle branch block? Does it work in patients with heart failure and right bundle branch block? Well, the evidence from at least three trials and a significant registry trial, which incorporated 15,000 patients, suggested that it doesn't work or it doesn't work as well. There was one trial, which is the RAFT trial, which showed a modest degree of benefit, but this was in patients with very broad right bundle branch block. Two, fu two further meta-analyses showed that there was no substantial benefit from treating patients with heart failure and right bundle branch block with CRT. Do we ever use CRT in patients with right bundle branch block? The answer is yes. We would implant patients who have a bradycardia indication for pacing and in whom we expect at least a 40 to 50% right ventricular pacing. If we didn't offer them CRT, then we would be causing mechanical and electrical desynchrony by creating left bundle branch block from pacing the right ventricle. So in suitable patients, we would use it. Does it work in patients with atrial fibrillation? Although the original data was more controversial, it is now very clear that they do work on the proviso that we can achieve 
close to 100% CRT. And it is well established that in most patients that can probably only be achieved with ablating the AV node. So we would aim for a 90 to 95% um, cardiac resynchronization in these patients. How we do it, um, if we could please play the clip, thank you. Uh, we approach the left ventricle through targets of the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is the venous drainage of the heart and conveniently it flows at the um, bottom of the right atrium. So we approach it through the right atrium via a chosen target vein and then advance the lead in position. The aim is to use a lateral or a post-lateral vein of the left ventricle simply because it confers um, more separation compared to the right ventricular lead, therefore allowing better cardiac resynchronization. I wish that in clinical practice uh, it was as simple as, um, can we please play the first clip at the top, uh, as this. So we implant a right ventricular lead first, uh, followed by the finding of the coronary sinus, finding a target vein, and then advancing the left ventricular lead in position taking the relevant measurements and then implanting a right atrial lead in patients in sinus rhythm or in patients who we have uh, plans to reestablish sinus rhythm. In doing so, obviously in the cardiac cath lab, the pictures are far less glamorous. Now if you could play the second clip in the middle, please. This is a typical venogram of the coronary sinus with a friendly vein just after the valve of Vucens in the mid coronary sinus. Excellent target for implanting the left ventricular lead. Hopefully with this, we will have transformed an ECG with very broad left bundle branch block, which you can see at the bottom into that ECG, which shows a narrower QRS without left bundle branch block. But importantly, if you look in lead one, the complex is a negative. That's because the signals will drive resynchronization early in the area of the latest activation. So resynchronization is driven from there, the signals go away, and therefore the QRS will be negative. So essentially CRT is an electrical treatment for an electrical problem. How about defibrillators? Well, from the outset, I would like to say that defibrillators are not beneficial in either asymptomatic patients with heart failure or in patients with very severe NYHA class four heart failure where, again, they are not cost effective. Where does the data come from? You will all remember the original MADIT-1 followed by MADIT-2 trials, which showed a significant mortality benefit. You will also remember the curves, which clearly demonstrated that uh, amiodron did not have any benefit in preventing sun, uh, sudden death in patients with heart failure. So in fact, the two curves, the placebo and the amiodron curves were parallel. There was absolutely no benefit. Scud heft was a landmark trial to demonstrate this point. And importantly, there was no substantial difference between ischemic and non-ischemic patients. The MADIT-2 trial had a substantial benefit which was maintained late. In fact, the patients who benefited most were patients who were most remote from the index event. There is recently some 
controversy over the benefits of using ICDs in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Definite trial showed a trend in mortality reduction. You're all familiar with the more contemporary Danish study, um, which showed very little, if any, benefit from implanting defibrillators in the uh, Danish populations. The issue is a little controversial across Europe and particularly in the US. We do adopt some parts of the Danish study, so we will offer defibrillators for primary prevention in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy on the proviso that they have either evidence of fibrosis or scarring on a cardiac MRI, or we find evidence of non-sustained VT, which are both risk markers. This is how ICDs work, so it's important to remember, at least in the UK, we've been using defibrillators since the early 90s. Initially, we used them for secondary prevention, so patients had to earn them by surviving initially not one but two cardiac arrests to get a defibrillator. Later on in September 2000, at least in the UK, we had the first National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines on primary prevention, which covered ischemic patients. Um, and now if we could play the um, clip, please. This is a heart that's just about, about to develop ventricular fibrillation. The fibrillators will work by trying to override the arrhythmia in the first instance. Of course, most VF will start with relatively stable VT. These therapies do work. If they don't, then we have the backup of a shock therapy. Shocks are painful, but they do save lives. It's interesting, running a devices clinic and coming across patients who have had 50 or 60 episodes of life-threatening ventricular tachycardia, all overridden by pacing therapies with no shocks and patients have no idea that they would have been in any danger whatsoever. And of course, uh, having a defibrillator and receiving shocks uh, will lead to driving bans and uh, a significant impact on um, lifestyle and so forth. Uh, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, cardiac resynchronization therapy works on top of the benefits already conferred by medical treatment. We say that 30% of patients are super responders, virtually normalizing the heart. 30% are responders with a 5 to 10% increase in the ejection fraction, a decrease in the size of the uh, left ventricle in systole, and a decrease in mitral regurgitation. And we say then 30% do not respond, but of course it's difficult to um, define non-responders. ICDs offer additional benefit, but they are expensive, and I would end by offering you a thought. And I would say that, particularly in more developing countries, it may be more cost efficient to offer cardiac resynchronization therapy with pacemakers rather than defibrillators because we would enable to treat four or five times more patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Nyota, for that excellent presentation. Uh, now, the sim uh, now the symposium open for questions. Uh, I ask the presenters to take the podium. Uh, due to the time constraint we are getting uh, late, uh, we will try to restrict questions only two or three. Any questions from audience?
Can we have Mike to talk to my other please? Yeah, my question is, if a patient with heart failure had a ventricular tachycardia, this is, uh, if we come, uh, you mentioned that beta uh, amidron has no mortality benefit. So what are you going to do uh, after the, if he had a ventricular tachycardia heart failure, you have to op increase the beta blockade or you are going to put on amidron. In our settings, I see this very difficult to these patients. Thank you. Um, firstly, um, I, I, I think um, I said that amiodron doesn't work in primary prevention patients. It doesn't prevent death. But you, if you are presented with a patient with heart failure, with ventricular tachycardia, my first line of treatment would be beta blockers. And actually what works very well is intravenous propranolol. It's cheap and cheerful, but as opposed to most other beta blockers, propranolol will have membrane stabilizing effects. So propranolol is actually great to be used intravenously in a patient with a VT storm. The patients that we usually come across are patients who have defibrillators in place and they keep getting shocks. And there are patients who will experience 20 or 30 shocks from the defibrillators. Once you've used beta blockers, you can use amiodron, of course. Um, in some older patients, you may come across conduction deficit issues without pacing support. If everything fails, remember, maintain a potassium between four and five, no higher, no lower. If that fails, you can paralyze and ventilate the patient, and as a last resort, offer a VT ablation treatment, particularly if the VT is ischemic. I have a question for Dr. Nuta. Uh, this is gonna be a tough one. CRTP or CRTD? Uh, because of the health economics, it's, it's, it's quite prohibiting for us to implant CRTD, offer CRTDs for every indicated patient. Um, how do you, in your practice, uh, make that decision? It is a multifactorial decision. Thank you for a great question. For primary prevention, we spend a long time discussing the two therapies with the patient and their family. We go through the benefits, but also the pitfalls of ICD therapy. And we don't usually offer defibrillators in patients over the age of 80. Not because we are ageists, but because it is relatively difficult to live with a defibrillator over the age of 80. A lot of other comorbidities will happen, and before we know it, we will be asked to um, turn the defibrillator off. So in most older patients, we tend to use CRTP treatment. I just make a point that um, defibrillators are not benign. And, you know, we translated a lot of our experience from bradycardia pacing um, into tachycardia pacing. And we were duped into thinking that the ICD lead was the same as a brady lead. And that's not the case, you know. If you look at the, certainly the contemporary literature at the moment, you're looking at between a 17 and 25% five-year problem with that lead and inappropriate shocks, inappropriate therapy, and so um, lead infections. And, and all of these are a real nuisance, and uh, patients need to be aware of that. And so really we should try and avoid um, ICD. And I certainly have started to move to using a subcutaneous ICD now more. One more question uh, uh, again for uh, Dr. Newta. Uh, regarding the CRT, it's, it's an uh, economical issue with CRT. So we know that there's a responders and non-responders, and very difficult to identify who is going to respond. So how do you know uh, after CRT these, uh, these, uh, these guys are responding? Uh, what is the criteria you're using, either imaging or the quality of life index? 
Thank you for another great question. Um, we simply repeat the echocardiogram six months post-implant and we review patients clinically. Um, there will be a number of patients with declared clinical benefit, but in fact, when we performed an echocardiogram, the ventricle has remained still, has not improved significantly. But the heart failure clinically looks much better and the patients are much happier. I would genuinely say that we come across that scenario probably 20 to 30 percent of the time. The rest we will see a fairly significant improvement. In the interest of time, we are going to have to wind up uh, this uh, symposium. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the three speakers for very enlightening uh, talks. And uh, Dr. Prakash, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Bogdan Nuta to um, accept a token of appreciation on uh, behalf of the President and the Council of uh, the Sri Lanka Heart Association uh, from Dr. Prakash. With that, we draw this symposium to conclusion. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. And next, moving on with the plenary, how important is cardiac rehabilitation after acute coronary syndrome by Professor Azwa Zaman. Co-chairs will be Dr. Sepalika Mendis and Dr. Sampat Vitanavansa. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for this invitation once again. You've just heard uh, three fantastic talks on uh, treatment of heart failure using largely high-tech devices and high-tech latest development pharmacotherapy. This is the other end of the extreme. So what I'm not going to tell you about how low-tech medicine, looking after the patient, treating with their lifestyle and cardiac rehabilitation can have just as much benefit as some of the high-tech interventions you have just heard about. So my remit here was to talk about cardiac rehabilitation in patients after acute coronary syndromes. Now, whilst I deal with acute coronary syndromes every single day, I'm only peripherally involved with the cardiac rehabilitation program. And the reason this remit is difficult is because the bulk of cardiac rehabilitation literature spans the 1980s and 1990s and relates largely to patients undergoing coronary revascularization, whether it's PCI or coronary artery bypass graft surgery. And there is a body of evidence on heart failure also. But that relating to acute coronary syndromes is few and far between. But as I will tell you, there are data out there to support cardiac rehabilitation. Those of you who were present yesterday at my talk will have seen this graph. And I show this to you to highlight the importance of non-pharmacology, non-interventional means uh, of improving out patient outcomes in, uh, after acute coronary syndromes. So what this is telling us is that in patients on optimal medical therapy after optimal coronary intervention, there is still a significant ischemic burden post-ACS. So the pie chart on the left tells us that in the immediate post-infarct survivors, 18.3% of patients will have one-year incidence of cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. If you look to the pie chart on the right, of the patients who are free of events in the first year, one in five, so 20% of patients, will go on to have a cumulative three-year incidence of cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. And what I want you to remember is that these patients have been optimally managed. These are patients who have been revascularized. These are patients who are on optimal guideline recommended therapy. 
So in spite of this, nearly one in five of our patients will go on to have an ischemic event. So this summarizes the state of cardiac rehabilitation studies uh, in the literature. As I said, the majority were conducted around 20, 30 years ago. And they included low-risk middle-aged males after a myocardial infarction and or a uh, PCI for elective angina. So what I've tried to do for this talk is to select uh, studies published only after 2014. The reason for that is because the treatment of acute coronary syndromes has moved on apace. New, new pharmacological treatments, and of course, interventional treatment, which is now standard for patients with uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome. So there's no point in looking at studies in the 80s and 90s, and therefore the papers that I will present to you are those from 2014. So that the evidence can carry weight, I have only selected those papers where there was more than a thousand patients studied. You will see when you look at the literature that there are many studies that have a handful of patients, 20, 30 even, or just a few hundred. So I've only selected those with over a thousand patients. And it is important if this is going to have relevance that these patients are on optimal therapy. And of course, the remit I was given by the committee was that I had to include ACS patients. But before I give the talk, it's important that you recognize that the bulk of the cardiac rehabilitation studies, uh, the data comes from largely three countries. The United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. So it's very important that whilst you will see the data, that when we come to the conclusions that you adapt this to the local community that you serve. You have to adapt cardiac rehabilitation, take into, taking into consideration the local social and cultural uh, uh, mores of whichever country, whichever uh, uh, nation that you are working in. So this is perhaps one of the latest studies and the largest studies looking at cardiac rehabilitation in a, a, a community in, in, in Holland. They looked at just, over, just under 36,000 patients un attending cardiac rehabilitation or uh, asked to attend cardiac rehabilitation. Of those, 11,000 chose to attend and just uh, uh, under 25,000 chose not to attend. And this is the problem that we have even in the West, that even though we know that cardiac rehabilitation works, many patients choose not to attend. So this group... Uh, uh, compared outcomes in the patients who chose to attend and used as a control group those who did not attend. This is a busy slide, but what I want you to concentrate on is the control group, which is the third column, and against the treatment group. But because the control group was not matched, what the authors did, they did a weighted control group using propensity matching, and you can see that the p-values in the last column shows that there was no difference between those who attended cardiac rehabilitation in the treatment arm and those in the weighted control group who were propensity matched. Let's move quickly to the nitty-gritty, the, the, what, what this study showed. So of the patients, there were a large number of uh, patients who attended post-acute coronary syndrome, just over 28,000 patients. If you look at the death per, per uh, thousand person years, you can see that of those patients who attended uh, a cardiac rehabilitation, that figure was 12.3 deaths per thousand person years. If you look to the right of patients who did not attend cardiac rehabilitation, that figure was just over double. And it's worth emphasizing that again. In the patients who attended cardiac rehabilitation after acute coronary syndrome, the figure was 12.1 deaths per thousand person years. In those who did not attend, it was 24.5 deaths per thousand person years. So another way of looking at that was that they looked at the benefit of attending cardiac rehabilitation in patients with acute coronary syndromes in 
six to 12 months. They looked at from six months because that's how long the cardiac rehabilitation program lasted for. So once the patients had completed cardiac rehabilitation, they looked at the benefit out to 12 months, to 24 months, and then out to 48 months, so out to four years. And you can see that there was a very significant benefit in uh, 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 um, hazard ratio of mortality, so that out to 12 months, from six to 12 months, there was a 58% reduction, to 24 months, 48% reduction, and to four years, a 43% reduction in uh, 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 cardiac um, uh, uh, mortality or survival. And this is shown in this graph here, in that patients who attended cardiac rehabilitation did significantly better to four years than those who did not attend cardiac rehabilitation. And that figure was from six months when cardiac rehabilitation was completed. So the summary of findings in this very large Dutch study which was a unique study in that it only had patients with ACS or coronary revascularization and or heart valve surgery. And I've only presented the data in patients in the charts with who attended after acute coronary syndrome. The take home message, very, very important for all of us who are look after patients who, uh, 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 with acute coronary syndrome, is that cardiac rehabilitation was associated with a significant, hugely significant survival benefit at four years. Importantly, this benefit was independent of the diagnosis, the type of intervention, and the follow-up duration. So what this means for this particular talk I'm giving to you, that this uh, uh, finding was uh, seen in patients who only had acute coronary syndrome, whether they had a coronary intervention or not. And it was relevant out to 12 months, 24 months, and out to four years that the study was conducted. In females, the survival benefit was only seen at two years and not at four years that was seen in the male participants. The second study that I came across was this one uh, reported in the European Heart Journal, Quality of Care and Clinical Outcomes. And I'm just going to give you a brief summary of the study and the findings. So once again, this was only the second study since 2014 that included more than 1,000 patients. So 1,159 patients undergoing cardiac rehabilitation were propensity matched, so carefully matched in terms of age and other risk factors, and matched to those not attending cardiac rehabilitation. It's important that you understand that even in Western Europe and America where cardiac rehabilitation programs are well established, have been running for 30, 40 years, that attendance is very, very poor. It's of the order of 40%, so the majority do not attend. And this was restricted to patients surviving 60 days uh, post-discharge. And this went on to five years, and the findings were a mirror image of the larger Dutch study, in that the cumulative mortality was almost 40% lower of those attending cardiac rehabilitation, both at five years and at 10 years. And the overall mortality risk at 10 years was 39%. Once again, I emphasize the point to you, this is important for you to remember that these were patients who were optimally managed on the best interventional treatment, on the best pharmacotherapy treatment that we can offer. So this low-tech intervention of cardiac rehabilitation, and I'll talk about what this involves, leads to a mortality reduction of 39% over and above coronary inter revascularization intervention, over and above pharmacotherapy. So is it worth it? So I could only find one later study on the economic evaluation, which as we've heard from previous studies in a country like Sri Lanka, and in fact in every country, the economic evaluation of any intervention is very, very important. So this study published in 2016 
looked at the economic evaluation of an exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation program, and specifically in those patients with a recent acute coronary syndrome. 204 patients were studied. They were randomized to one year of exercise-based therapy, ECR, versus usual care. And the cost estimate was based on the typical cost estimate, how we assess it, which was based on uh, 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 quality-adjusted life years. It's a well-recognized method of uh, uh, economic evaluation in, in medicine. So those patients who attended cardiac rehabilitation, there was a 24,000 €511 benefit quality-adjusted life year for those who attended an exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation program. And in this study, they found a relative risk reduction of 73% in the combined endpoint of mortality, recurrent coronary event, or hospitalization for heart failure, okay, in patients with an acute coronary syndrome. So the other studies of 39% and 40% reduction was in cardiac mortality. When you combine mortality with recurrent coronary events and heart failure, this study showed a 73% reduction and a over 24,000 euro quality adjusted life year benefit in those patients attending cardiac rehabilitation. So how can you implement it? Remember. You have to implement it taking into consideration the local patient, the local cultural and social mores. It is very, very important. So cardiac rehabilitation is the coordinated sum of activities designed to influence, to influence, remember, the underlying cause of cardiovascular disease. You have to provide in that program the best means to, uh, uh, for the best possible physical, mental, and social condition for that patient to change the underlying cause of that cardiovascular disease. The goal is that the patient, through their own efforts moving forward, can preserve or resume optimal functioning in their community, whatever their job, whatever their role is in that community, regardless of their age. And the key thing is, is that we have to improve and change their behavior so that their risk of further cardiovascular events is uh, reduced or reversed. What are the core components? There are six core components. Okay, this is relevant to the UK, but it has to be implemented in this country if you're going to see the same benefit. The first thing is you have to have change of behavior. So that involves education. If they've been admitted with an acute coronary syndrome, typically you will find that their lifestyle uh, 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 previously has not been optimal for cardiovascular health. So you have to modify and change their lifestyle. It's important that you address their psychosocial health and many cardiac rehabilitation programs fail because there is not a psychologist involved in the program. It is important that there are both a psychologist and a dietitian involved in the program. You have to manage their medical risk, so it, it is important that this program is led by a physician. You have to deal with both short-term and long-term strategies. Short-term with how they overcome their psychological barriers to having had an acute coronary syndrome, long-term to how they change their behavior. And what is very important, and we are recognizing this in the UK, is that you have to keep very, very careful records and you have to submit this to a national body so that we can see what is happening in each region across the country and we can modify and share good practice across each region. This is a busy slide, but it's important that if you start this across this country, any country, that you have certain standards that you try and maintain across all the regions, all the hospitals uh, uh, in the country. So you have to deliver the six components. It's important that you have qualified and competent multidisciplinary, and this is the key. It cannot be led just by a physician. It cannot be led just by a nurse. You have to have physicians, nurses involved, dietitians, psychologists involved. It has to be multidisciplinary. You have to identify the appropriate patients. That's relatively easy because we now are very good at identifying patients who come in with acute coronary syndrome. 
Initial assessment is important. That has to happen within the hospital. The early provision of a cardiac rehabilitation program is also important. You cannot let the patients go home and then have them enter a program four months, two months, six months down the line. It has to start in the hospital. The information has to be given. The education has to start within the hospital. Once the program is completed, a final assessment of the individual patient needs to occur. And as I said, the sixth thing is that it is important that you do this in a, a very logical fashion that uh, can, collects the data for the hospital, for the region, for the nation. So somebody needs to be a champion of cardiac rehabilitation in Sri Lanka and to set it up and to set up an uh, audit uh, uh, database uh, uh, that collects all the information. And the reason I say this is that, as I said to you before, even in well-established cardiac rehabilitation programs in Western Europe, in America, the attendance is very, very poor. The majority fail to complete a cardiac rehabilitation program. This country, if it's going to make an impact, has to look at the problems that have, uh, uh, we have had in the West and overcome them and make sure that completion uh, uh, and referral rates for cardiac rehabilitation are far greater than that which we see in Western Europe and in North America. The American Heart Association, just in a recent uh, uh, um, communication, has suggested that it is a lack of knowledge about the benefits of cardiac rehabilitation amongst both patients and healthcare providers, which is a major factor in its underutilization. And you can see why. If I talk to an audience about stents, about expensive technologies, rotablations, laser, what you've heard before, cardiac resynchronization therapy, it's very, very attractive. We all like to think that we can put expensive equipment in patients and that benefit. Something that is low tech, that involves education, that involves more work, that involves a treatment over the next six months, one year, is not as attractive to healthcare providers. But this is cheap, and what I hope I, I've shown you is that it is hugely effective, but it needs each and every one of us to be a champion if we are going to uh, 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 do the best for our patients after they leave hospital with an acute coronary syndrome. So in summary, even in patients receiving the best treatment for acute coronary syndrome, those who attend cardiac rehabilitation have significant benefit up to four years in very, very large studies and up to 10 years in smaller studies. The important message to take home is that Cardiac rehabilitation in this patient population is of huge economic benefit to the nation. And of course, it's of huge benefit to the patient in that it is very, very cost effective. The problem that you face, the problem that we face, whether developing nations or in Western Europe and North America, is that even in countries with long established programs, completion of the cardiac rehabilitation by individual patients is very, very poor. And you have an opportunity in this country, if you're going to start this program, is that you look at the, uh, uh, the programs, you look at the six core components, and you seriously think about how you're going to implement it so that you lead to greater success than we have seen uh, 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 elsewhere. And the challenge for all healthcare systems is to identify and address these barriers uh, 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 to change. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Zaman, for that excellent uh, lecture on cardiac rehabilitation, uh, giving, an, uh, in, I mean, giving all the benefits of cardiac rehabilitation. I think all the cardiac interventionists uh, here who, and, the, and the, the cardiologists who are treating acute coronary syndrome, this lecture is an encouragement uh, to start programs in your own centers. And in fact, the, the, the council and the president and the council this year is there. One of the aims is to you know, uh, establish cardiac rehabilitation 
programs in periphery. Actually, we have started a program at the National Hospital. For the last 16 years, we have been doing it. So far, I have completed nearly 6,000 patients uh, we have rehabilitated. And um, I, would, I really would, uh, you know, I'm really very happy that you gave this lecture in this session to encourage all the cardiologists to start their programs in their own centers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saman. Thank you very much for that um, very thought-provocating lecture that in Sri Lanka, what we are facing, I think the main issue is lack of awareness of the uh, benefit of the cardiac rehabilitation. I assume most of our colleagues, the cardiologists, not seen how patients improved after cardiac rehabilitations. Now, in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, we don't have a program to incorporate patients just after procedure, just after acute coronary syndrome. We get them after months sometime. But even at that time, you don't believe some patients are not sleeping because of a fear of death. And some people are not having any sexual activity for a long time because of fear of uh, the uh, death or another heart attack. So cardiac rehabilitation, even though you had, you correctly pointed out, uh, not only the mortality benefit, uh, quite big social and mental benefit, and the patients are hugely improved, that we, uh, I have my personal experience over the last seven years, and it's a very, very cost-effective, amazing tool. I appeal all my colleagues to start your cardiac rehabilitation program or otherwise for physicians, please refer wherever the cardiac rehabilitation available. It's an amazing tool. Thank you very much for a very thought-provoking lecture.